Hello, chess fans. Uh, man, it's I have not gotten to do nearly as many videos lately as I have wanted to. Uh, ever since we get went back to in-person chess clubs, I uh, just haven't had the the need to, and I have been pretty busy with work and everything. So I've not put out a whole lot of videos. Um, I did want to put one out. We uh, my chess clubs are not meeting in person this week uh, because I'm out, but I wanted to put out this video. Uh, on in games, this is a, I have been playing in an online tournament for several years now. I'll tell you more about it. But one of the things that has really come out in this latest round is just how important some of the basic in game knowledge is. Almost every one of my games has come down to me understanding the end games better than my opponents. Even games that I should have lost, I've come out winning. So let me tell you a little bit about this tournament. It started with 228 players. We're playing this on chess.com. It was seven days per move. We've been going through about one round per year. Each round has 12 players in a group and the top three advance. So I won my first group, I won my second group, I won my third group, and we were in the final round. There are only, I think, six of us left uh, I have only two games remaining. I have won all of the games so far this round. Uh, of the two games remaining, they're against the same player who hasn't finished any of his games. Uh, one of those games is pretty much over. I'm going to win that one too. The other one, um, I kind of hung upon. Yes, oops. Uh, so this guy kind of has a chance to catch me and at least tie for first, but other than that, uh, I should win this tournament, which is pretty exciting. I got into this tournament specifically so I could generate positions uh, for teaching, and my goodness, I've gotten just a, a wealth of teaching opportunities out of this tournament. Every time I've got games going on, I get uh, you know, a good lesson or two every week for the chess clubs that I run. And so, because so many of them came down to these king and pawn or king and queen end games, I thought it'd be really good to put a video together to, that kind of encapsulates several of the principles that have come into play this last round. Now, some of this stuff is very basic and very rudimentary, but I, I want to make sure that we all start from the same place. Uh, if you've been working with me, if I've been coaching you, some of the stuff you've pro you may have seen, some of it you know pretty well by now. Uh, I think the most important thing to start with, with almost every kid I coach, is as soon as they understand how to move the pieces, I want them to understand how to checkmate. And the most important checkmate is knowing how to checkmate with a king and a queen. If you can do that, you can win some games. That is just that simple. And so, real quick, we're going to review that. If you just have a king and a queen, uh, if you just check the king over and over by moving the king and queen back and forth, you're never going to get anywhere. It's just back and forth and, and nothing happens. Now, even if I had my king close, if I could put my queen, um, if I could put my queen right here and the king was close enough to cap, to prevent capture, notice this king could still escape to a couple different squares. Or if I put my queen on this square, the king could still escape to a couple squares. So you can never check the king into checkmate in this position. However, if you can create a barrier around the king, like put the queen a knight's move away, right? See how that's a knight's move away from the king. Now, the queen is blocking off everything on this row and this diagonal. That only leaves three squares for the king to move to. And you'll notice each of those three squares are closer to either one wall or another wall. But no matter where he moves, he's gonna get closer to one of the walls. So let's say he scoots over, gets close to this wall. Then whatever he does, you wanna do the same thing. Keep that same relative position where you're just a knight to move away. Because now, again, he only has the same choices. Move closer to one wall or move closer to the other, okay? And so if he ever says, oh, well, I can just go back and forth. Well, no, you can't. Because if I keep that same relative position, now the queen's blocked off a new row. and you are closer to one wall and you can't get out of this uh, barricade the queen has put around you. Eventually, you're gonna to get to a position where the king 
has to move against the wall. No matter where the king moves, he's going to be against the wall. Whenever he does that, you want to put the queen so she traps the king against the wall, but is not close to the king. So let's say, for example, the king moves over here. I want to trap the king on this wall by putting the queen somewhere on this wall, but not too close. So the best square for that is right here. Bring the queen over here. Now notice that the queen is blocked off all of these squares and this square. There's a barrier around the king now, and the king is stuck. The queen doesn't need to do anything else while the king is just bouncing around in there. You bring your king in. Now it's very important, notice that I went towards the inside of the board with my king. That's really important because in some cases, if you go along the wall, you can actually end up stalemating uh, the black king. But once the king gets to this position, where it is uh, you know, a, a, a diagonal move away from the corner, no matter where the king is, the opposing king is, the white queen can come in and checkmate. So let's back up just a little bit and say, okay, what if the king went to this wall? Okay, well, you can still come to this spot. So now the king is on the first rank and the queen is blocking off the second rank. Still creating a barricade around the king for your king to come in again to that F3 square in this case. But really it's just that uh, uh, diagonally opposed square two away from the corner. Uh, once the king reaches f3, uh, it doesn't matter where the black king is, the queen can checkmate. Okay, well, what if the king moves to the corner? Well, now you have options. You can pretend like the king is on the file or on the rank. Whichever one you pick, it doesn't even matter. You just pick one. And you, again, you want to put your queen on a square that is far away from the king but traps them on that wall. So if we say the king is on the h file in this case, I would want again to move my queen to g5. Now I would not want to move my queen to g3 because that would be stalemate. Because notice if I move queen to g3, I've just taken away all the squares from the king and now the king can't move at stalemate. Or I could pick and say the king is on the first rank and then again d2 would work very well. E2 would also be an option, but you might as well just stick with D2. You're now trapping the king in, creating a barricade, and you bring your king in, and it's checkmate once the king reaches F. Once your your king reaches F3, and you just put the queen right next to the king wherever he is. Okay, so that's a basic principle. If you know that, you can win some games, but you got to get there. So let's take a look at this. This is. Uh, a really important concept, something called the square of the pawn. The idea is if the black, if you draw a, a line from the pawn to the promotion square and then draw a line horizontally the same distance, this forms a square. You see that? If the black king cannot step, or sorry, if your opponent's king, whether black or white, if your opponent's king cannot step into that square on his turn, then your pawn can promote safely. Every time your pawn moves, that square gets smaller. And there's nothing the black king can do to stop it. This is a really important concept. Because we, you may have heard that past pawns are really strong, that, that they were very powerful. That's true, but not all past pawns are equal. So I'm going to show you a position in one of my games where I miscalculated. A few moves ago, I had basically set up a draw offer to trade off my rook with my opponent's rook, and he refused, and he went around and decided to try to take out some of my pawns. In the process, I took out some of his, and I thought in this position, okay, I'm pretty sure that if I trade pawns here, I can hold because I'm going to have two passed pawns. And so I played rook to f4. I've got the black pieces, thinking if the white trades, I'm going to have two passed pawns, and my two passed pawns are better than white's two passed pawns. Well, I was wrong. Okay, Watch what happens after we recapture. I thought the white king had to step up immediately. 
and would actually probably end up taking out this pawn. He would step up, I would step up, he would capture, and then my king would be close enough to prevent these from promoting, and if he ever tried to come and capture mine, I could get all of his pawns and win. So I could at least hold the draw, and if he made any mistakes, I'd win. That was what I was thinking. I forgot about the pawn of the, the square of the pawn, though. You see, on the next move, white had the chance to create a passed pawn that was so far away from my king, there's nothing I could do about it. See, I was... I kind of made this move while I was doing something else, and then about two minutes later, I was imagining the board in my head, and I said, why can't white play d4 right away? I had thought about that move, but I didn't think it was immediately possible and I don't know why, I was just distracted. If white plays d4 right away, even if I capture back, notice white now has a white pawn, and I cannot get to the square of that pawn on my turn. So even though I have three passed pawns, this one passed pawn for white is better than my three passed pawns. My opponent should have won this game. I was very, very lucky. My opponent instead played king to f3. When I played king to g6, he played king to f4. I am now within the square of the pawn. He made a move like this which completely lost the game for him because after he stepped over and I captured, he captured my pawn and I went around and captured three of his pawns and I get a pass. So we're gonna come back to this game a little bit later. But the main point here was if my opponent had understood the square of the pawn a little better, he would have beaten me. And if I had thought about the square of the pawn a little sooner, I wouldn't have given him the chance. Okay, so that's if the pawn is, if your king is outside the square of the pawn, you can't stop it. Well, what about if your king is inside the square of your pawn? Well, it depends. In a situation like this, we have something called opposition. In this case, whoever moves first is at a disadvantage. So if white moves first, black holds the draw. If black moves first, white wins. This is another really important concept. If you're going into your end games and you know you're going to have a passed pawn, but your opponent's king is going to be in front of it, you need to make sure that your king can get in front of your pawn as well. If your king is ever beside or behind your pawn, it's not going to work out. Now, if you have another piece that you can move, another pawn that you could move and turn, a, turn the game around, then you're going to be okay. And that happened in several of my games where my opponent thought maybe I could hold the draw here because uh, they had the opposition, but I still had one move I could make that flipped things around. So let me show you what I mean. If white has to move, black just steps in front of the king. White's king can never move forward. So if white ever moves the pawn forward, the black king just steps in front of it and stays directly in front of it. If the white king steps up, black king plays over. And then eventually, you have a choice. If you step over here, it's a draw. Because black cannot move to any of these squares. They are all protected. If instead you move away from your pawn, black king captures, and it's a draw. So let's go back and show what to do if it is uh, black to play first. Let me triangulate real quick to switch the game around. Okay, here we go. Same position, uh, but now it's black to move. When black moves to the side, white king just steps up in the other direction. With the idea of white is trying to get to this target square of c7, because once white gets to c7, the pawn is able to march while being protect protected. So black will frequently step back to d8 to guard that square, white steps over, gets the opposition again, and now white just takes it over here. If black tries to chase down the pawn, he can't, because he can't come here, can't come to any of these squares, and so at this point, white is going to queen, and now we're back to that position that hopefully you understand how to win with a king and a queen, like we saw earlier in the video. Okay. 
So let's say you have gotten your queen, but black's about to get a queen too. You had a pawn race and you won by two steps. So let's say black just moved their pawn up one away from queening. This is another concept that came up in this tournament, is how do you stop your opponent from getting the queen? Because if black can get the queen, then it's gonna be a draw. So the idea is to use repeated checks and pins so that your, your king can slowly make progress in. So the queen is just doing everything she can to use checks and pins to prevent the black pawn from advancing. Anytime black steps into a pin or steps onto the promotion square, so in other words, if, if black's king is sitting in front of the pawn, you don't have to check. You, you can use that as an opportunity to bring your king in. So let's see how this might work. You would start by uh, playing a check. Black, knowing that he doesn't want to block his own pawn, would usually step away from the pawn. So you can attack the pawn or you can check the king. Either way works. Uh, and this is probably best to uh, attack the pawn. Black might step over uh, to f1 or f2. But once you check while touching the pawn, black can't, black can't move away from the pawn anymore because then you capture the, the pawn. So instead, black would move in front and now's your chance to bring the king in. When black moves away, if he steps into a pin again, then you can bring the king in again. What black should have done is moved up to this square. Now you have to check him and again play the same idea as we did on the other side. Until black steps in front of the pawn again and you move your king up. Eventually, as you do this over and over again, white's king will be close enough that even if black's king steps right next to the pawn, you can get really close. And then you can finally capture the pawn and checkmate. Okay? So that's the idea, is you want to use pins and block it and using the king blocking his own pawn to bring your king in to eventually take that pawn out. Okay, so that seems like, okay, that should work really well, but there are actually instances where it doesn't work. What I've done is I've taken the same position, but I've shifted the black king over one square, and now the pawn is on the bishop's file. If the black pawn is on the bishop's file, this is actually a draw. This is weird. Why would that make a difference? Well, it turns out you can play that check. Black steps over to h1. You could play the check again. Now it's like, okay, well, now you can take the pawn, right? Oh, wait a second. If you take the pawn, it's a draw. If you don't take the pawn and you check, black never steps in front of the pawn because he knows he can get the draw. So black's best bet is to get a draw on this position. Now, this happened in one of my games where this is that game I said earlier that I should have lost because he could have gotten that passed pawn on c5. Well, he finally got the passed pawn on c5, but look, it's a bit different position now. I've got, I'm about to queen on b1. And if I queen, I can actually get, if, if he tries to advance his pawn too fast, I can bring my queen all the way down and set my pawn on the promotion square. Now that's always the best idea. If you can put your queen on the promotion square, then there is nothing that the black that your opponent's king is going to be able to do to stop you from eventually winning this. Even if um, even if my king was in a different position, I can always walk around um, and come at it from this angle. So 
that's that's a really important concept. Now, in this case, my opponent did not play the king pawn forward, and because the pawn was still one square away from c7, I could still do get the promotion square, but my opponent instead of playing put the king on d7 to prevent me getting the promotion square. Now, that still gave me a free turn to bring my king up. So when he tries to promote, or when he tries to get his pawn over, my king is a little bit closer than before. So when he stepped here, my queen came down to pin the pawn. And when he stepped over, my king stepped down. And notice, no matter what he does, he has two legal moves. He can move the pawn and queen, or he can move the king over to a8. Let's see what happens with both moves. If he queens, then I have checkmate over here. If he moves the king over, if I take the pawn, it's a draw. But if I play c8, now it's checkmate. So. In this position, my opponent resigned. So this was a situation where he had a bishop's pawn, but because my queen was already on the inside, on the B file, when the, queen, when the pawn was on the C file, I was able to prevent the king from getting over into the drawing position until it was too late, and my king was close enough. So it's still possible to win these games when your opponent has the pawn on a bishop file, but it's not as easy. If my king had been one square further away, it doesn't work, okay? If, uh, if, yeah, if my queen had been on the wrong side of the pawn, it doesn't work. So, usually you have to be very careful. If you're going to an end game and your opponent has a bishop's pawn and you're in a pawn race, you need to make sure that you're going to have time to get your queen to block that promotion square first. Similarly, if your opponent's pawn is a rook pawn, they can also get the draw, the same idea, by bringing the pawn all the way to a7 or h7 and putting their king right in front of it. And there's no way to force that king out uh, without allowing the queen to happen. So it typically ends out in a stalemate. Okay, let's see. I wanted to cover a couple more things real quick with this video that came, that also came up in games, and this is uh, called un I call this uncapturable pawn structures. Really, really useful idea. Um, obviously, this this looks really good for white. It is really good for white. This is just a simplification. Um, but what the point is is when you have two pawns connected like this, two past pawns connected. Um, and your opponent doesn't have any pieces on the board, they only have other pawns that might be tied up uh, or in a pawn structure or anything, you have a major advantage because the, your opponent's king is stuck right here with these pawns. Um, no matter what you do, black cannot leave these two pawns. He has to step back and forth between them. Because if he ever captures one, you queen, and you already know how to win with a queen. So that's that pattern is something that I call an uncapturable pawn structure. If you capture it, you you give up a queen. Uh, something very similar um, is where the two pawns or knights jump away. As long as they are knights jump away, they are blocking both squares in between, and so black cannot come over to get this pawn. He can only step back and forth. So while he's stuck there, your king can march around and do whatever it needs to to pick off any other pawns that are on the board. Uh, now, as, the way this position is drawn, it's actually pretty easy for white to win without even coming and grabbing the pawn over here. But the idea is still the same. These two pawns are untouchable. If black tries to capture one, the other promotes. And that's it. So 
be aware of end games with these pawn structures and if you get a chance to go into an end game with one you know you're going to be better now there's some other ideas that have come up in some of my games uh, particularly some ideas with pawn blockades where you use pawns to prevent your opponent's king from infiltrating I would love to show you some of those right now, but the games that, uh, that these are coming to play in are still in progress, and I, I would feel really, really guilty if I put one of those games into an analysis board because I don't want to see the analysis of them uh, before the game is over. That's called cheating. So uh, I don't want to look at those games um, and even though uh, I'm pretty confident I have the win in one, uh, if I stuck it on an analysis board, uh, I'd know whether I actually have the one, win or not or if I've missed something. So I'm not going to do that because I don't cheat. Don't ever cheat at chess. That's not fun. Anybody can cheat and then you're not actually playing chess. And then what's the point? I, I've never understood why people cheat. It, it makes no sense to me. So don't cheat at chess, even online long games, don't cheat. Don't look things up, don't use your computer. You play, you take pride in your victories. You can't take pride in a win if the computer won it for you. Who cares if you got a little sticker or a badge? It's pointless because you didn't, the computer did. So, uh, because the games with pawn blockades are still ongoing, uh, I don't want to look at those in this video, but hopefully I will be able to put another video together sometime soon to show you some more stuff with pawn style in games with these pawn blockades because it's pretty cool. I've created a blockade that my opponent couldn't do anything about and so because of this, even though he has an outside pass pawn, he can't really do anything about it because it's, actually it's not even passed it's just an outside pawn he can't really advance it because i can walk all the way around i have the entire side of the board free and he's stuck watching my pawns and he can't even come close to them because of the blockade they have set up so pawn blockades are fun another way to free up your king while tying their king down to a specific spot anytime you can control your opponent's king and control their pieces that's advantage for you so uh, that tournament almost done. Hopefully the games will finish up and I'll be able to put out some more content for you. But uh, the whole point is if you know your end games, if you know the pawn structures and you know how to prevent promotions or get promotions, you're going to have an advantage in your game. This is what has carried me through this tournament is knowing my end games and knowing how to win them. I have won so many games that I should have lost because I just had a better in-game knowledge than my opponents. Uh, it's amazing how many of these games I have started in bad positions and have been able to turn it around. So I encourage you to study these things, study your in-games, get practice with them, and enjoy your games of chess. It's, man, every game there's always chances to, to turn things around, so never give up. One of the things I always tell my kids is don't resign, never resign. Uh, even in the game that I just hung upon, I wanted to just hit the resign button right away, and I'm not going to. I'm, I'm probably gonna lose the game, but I'm not gonna resign. I'm, I'm gonna force my opponent to win against me because I've already won so many games I should have lost, and I've lost a few games I should have won too. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this, I hope it was useful, and I will see you next time.